Welcome to the Podski. What? Oh, yeah. You understand, baby? Dig it. Let me tell you another thing. First name John, last name Baker. Uh-huh. Brother. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Podski. I am your host, the man of a thousand gimmicks, John Baker. And today is a another documentary review with Allison and I. Uh, We're going to discuss the 11 Minutes documentary. It is on Paramount Plus, and it is about the shooting that happened during the Route 91 Harvest Festival. And we really wanted to get on and talk about it because we were really compelled by the documentary and everything that was covered in it. It's we felt that it's an incredibly important topic to talk about and it's something that we both really wanted to get on here and talk about so if you are unaware or if you know you are it's not clicking with what happened a there was a mass shooting in las vegas in 2017 Um, 58 people had died and 869 people were injured in this mass shooting. It's the largest mass shooting in United States history. And this documentary uh, recovers all of that, uh, the entire events that happened, the aftermath, all of it. And it's filled with actual footage, uh, cell phone footage of people that were actually there and uh, body cam footage of the first responders. It's a very well put together documentary and uh you know i just kind of want to get out front you know i give a warning in the beginning of the podcast once we get into it but i also want to do um an additional warning that you know this is an incredibly hard watch you know it's something that you don't want to just you know fire up on your friday night or saturday afternoon like you should really like mentally prepare to watch this because it it really pulls you in and makes you feel like you were there and um so you know just want to get that out there um you know i want to thank allison for being a part of the podski again she um is going to be our documentary specialist and uh so you know really excited that allison was on the podski huge thanks to her again uh hopefully you all enjoyed last week's episode of the Podski with the um my my favorite royal rumble moments uh we got another special episode coming up next week with uh az jarhead again and we're gonna then whenever az jarhead's on the pod that means we got uh, a top 10 so we're gonna do a top 10 list next week and you know just thank you to all the supporters of the Podski. We're, we're onward and upward. We're shucking and jiving. You know, we're we're doing some really good stuff here. I'm really proud of all of this. And, you know, I just want to thank you to all the listeners. And don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. Follow us on Twitter at the underscore Podsky, uh, as well as on Instagram at the underscore Podsky. And uh, we're on Facebook as well, available on every single platform you possibly think of. You know, just want to thank everybody that's a part of the Podsky family here and you know, it, we just really wanted this. You know, this will be a slight departure from, you know, the regular podcast that you listen to on here. Mostly, we're about having fun and talking professional wrestling and documentaries that we watch and all that. But you know, this is a really serious topic, and you know, Allison and I took it very serious for the, you know, the victims and their families because this is a five-year anniversary of that tragic accident and you know we wanted to you know pay our respects and you know be respectful to those families and you know it's just something that we really wanted to do and uh we hope you all enjoy so if it's something that you don't want to listen to uh, i apologize but um next week we'll be back again with our regular topics and um you know we'll also be having a that's so dolphins talk again on sunday so um Hope you all enjoy this podcast because we really enjoyed it and thank you. So let's get into 11 minutes on Paramount Plus.
Hello and welcome into another episode of the Podski, and we have our reoccurring guest here, Allison. Thanks for being another guest on the Podski. Thanks for having me again. So uh, today we wanted to get together and talk about a documentary that we recently watched because we felt it was it's a really important topic. It's a very sensitive subject, but a very important conversation that should be had with everybody. And it is uh, on Paramount Plus. It is called 11 Minutes, and it is about the mass shooting in Vegas uh, that happened in 2017 at the Route 91 Harvest Festival. And my first impressions of this documentary is that it is a very, very hard watch. You, This is not something that you should just fire up right away and watch. Like You should really try to mentally prepare yourself because it's something that was a really, really hard watch, for, at least for myself. And I also feel like we need to add... A little bit of a trigger warning just for the podcast itself because we will be talking about difficult topics and um, things that happened on the documentary so not only for the documentary itself but also while you're listening to this podcast just be aware right and it's th- there's just a lot to take in and I don't think I've ever watched a documentary like this and just I, I just felt so I personally felt uncomfortable watching it because I felt like it's something that I shouldn't be watching. I think it was the live footage. Yeah, there so yeah, it, that if, makes it the difference in other shooting documentaries was this one had just so much live footage. Yeah, typically in like other shooting documentaries that we've watched, it's a lot of retelling. More retelling and they were telling the story with you and it was really, really hard to like continuously see the camera footage that a lot of these people had, like that were at the festival. And it, it, there's a lot, and there's body cam f- footage of the police that were, and all the first responders as well. Like there was so much footage that I thought that was incredible that they were able to gather all of this. But I mean, if you think about it, like people go to concerts, that's what they're there doing they have gopros and um their phones are always out some photographers were probably there so the fact that they gathered all of that is impressive but it's also extremely scary of how much of a record there is out there of what actually happened right yeah it it is a lot and it it really made it really put you in that space like i felt like i was there throughout the entire documentary because they were they had the filming like not only at the festival but like in the streets and then like in the hospital as well and in the hotels hotels, like well I'm sure we'll get into it in a little bit here but we just I personally wanted to give an upfront trigger warning because it it, there it there's a lot and I just wanted we personally want to be able to tell this and do this podcast or on the podcast we want to do this justice because we wanted to make it for the victims because and their families this one personally kind of hits not personally hits home for us but we had somebody in our community that had passed away through this and we want to do justice for them because it, it it's a very sensitive topic and it's a very serious topic and that's what we kind of wanted to do here today with this podcast a lot of the things that we do here, it, this is really relevant to us as well because we went to a concert last night and it's one of those things that I don't ever think about it, but it's really sad that now in today's world that in the back of your mind, you kind of have to think about something like this happening. And I personally don't think about it, but I don't know about you. Do you? I'll honestly say that ever since um the ariana grande bombing happened in paris that's when i started like having somewhat of a fear and anxiety going to concerts just thinking about the fact that there's so many people gathered around in one area that just makes it so simple for someone to do such an evil thing i'll say though for some reason outdoor concerts have always scared me more i don't know why I think it's just because of the 
It's the environment. It's the open environment, yeah. all of that. I, I like the outside venues. Like, we've gone to outside venue concerts, and I've really enjoyed them. And I don't know, it just, just just because there's the confined space gives you a little bit more security. Yeah. And I think it's because people have to come through more security to get in an indoor event than an outdoor event. Like, when you're in an outdoor event, there's access to that area without having to enter in the actual event itself. Right, yeah. There, there's only certain ways to get into an indoor venue. And right now, I absolutely agree. There's a lot of things that happen in the documentary a lot. And there's they, they have a lot of the firsthand, they have uh, first responders in the video that I thought were really powerful. And you had the victims as well, which was even more powerful because they were the ones that were, you know, right there as it was happening to them and i couldn't the strength that they have to sit there and talk about it and talk about it so well and profoundly like i was amazed the entire time yeah i absolutely agree it was really they were able to like just the what you said the strength and the ability to sit there and tell their story it, it was inspiring mm-hmm and in the fact that yes yeah, something really bad can happen to you and you can be a part of something so evil but you know there's always a there's always a tomorrow there's always a brighter day and that um the one uh girl her name was Natalie she was inc- incredibly inspiring throughout the whole entire one she was uh if you watch it she had a she was shot in the face uh right on her chin and she was a cancer survivor and she had gone to the festival to with, with her husband to kind of celebrate. I am cancer free for ten years, and I thought, and her whole story about how she was shot in the face, and she didn't really know how bad it was until like they got to the hospital, and she looked so strong, and she was really inspiring. I, I, I think she said she noticed how, or she saw how bad it was whenever um she started being able to see other people's faces because as she was running and traveling to get to a safe space, she couldn't see anyone because it was dark outside. Mm -hmm. But once they got to that hotel lobby, that's when she said she realized like something was, it was way worse than what she thought. Yeah. And her, the, just the strength that she had. It's her outlook. Yeah. She she had a, still has a positive outlook. She, her outlook on the entire thing was really, it was, really incredible because she was like yes like i'm in a really bad spot today but that doesn't mean i'll be like that forever like there she continuously said that throughout the entire thing like yes there's always a tomorrow and i I can always get better and we can all get better together and i just really she was she was a really really huge bright spot in this whole entire thing so we're introduced early on in the documentary to josh haynes he is a detective in the las vegas police department and he was working the event with a uh, a policeman who was on his first day on the job. Uh, his name was Brady, and Brady kind of mentioned how you know this would be a really cool event for me to do. Like it's my first day on the job, and like I'm working an event that I would actually want to go to. And it their their story together throughout this documentary was really touching because it. Josh, who mentioned he was a former UFC fighter, and I, I don't know if he, I felt like he looked familiar. I don't, he, I rec, I feel like I recognized him from UFC. Um, but that was a cool little tidbit that they added in there. But their story together was really nice because Josh looked at Brady as like I, I'm a father figure for him. I'm responsible for him, and. Brady's dad, who was another police officer, they kind of like did the whole like, you know, welcome onto the force, uh, your first day, you've made it. And, you know, they did that before they went to work the event. So Josh had this like really prideful feeling for that. Like, I'm responsible for you and I want this to be a really good experience for you and I'm going to show you the way. And then all of this kind of happens and uh, Brady ends up getting shot and josh he was helping people he, they were yeah right. i think they were trying to they were behind the cars they were pulled up behind the cop cars yeah. trying to figure out where it was coming from and 
Brady had taken a round in his like tricep area, back area, and Josh instantly he acted immediately. They got out of there, and and you know, if it wasn't for Josh doing that, like Brady most likely would have died. And he and then you know they get later into the story about how Josh like really felt bad because he wasn't there the whole time, but he was saving Brady and. That made me feel like the feeling that you had throughout this whole entire thing and Josh's story, you know, directly, it, it was really touching that, you know, like he was like, I, I couldn't be there. I wish I was there. But his quote that he had, you know, in the moment, like people got up and acted and did what they had to do. They did the right thing. I think the most touching part for me watching it was their conversation in the car together because Josh was trying to keep Brady awake and just hearing them talk about like, this is, this is why we became a cop. Like this is what we do it for. It just put a little bit of a perspective for me, especially like recently. I understand that there's good cops and bad cops and there is obviously police brutality, but I think it just was really important that the documentary painted the picture the way that they did like these cops are real people and they did whatever they could possibly do to help these people that night and they all have a story and just because one cop is bad doesn't mean that they all are and I think that it really helped show that they are just human beings just like the rest of us and they most of them took on that job to help people and I think that it was a really good reminder of that. I absolutely agree. Yes, the the, and we were able again. We were able to get all of this audio from them from their body cams, and you know it was really touching to hear like you know like them talk and interact with each other throughout the night, trying to get to the hospital and and you know get to get Brady into safety. That it, it was, really sounded like a father son relationship. It it really did. And I there was like a bond that was forming there and you could just hear it and it was it was really it was really, really touching. And you know, to counter your point about, you know, police, uh there was several off duty policemen and everything like Dean McCauley, he was a Seattle firefighter. He had you know, stepped in and there, the story, this was a really, really another powerful part of the whole documentary. Dean had, you know, sprung into action and he was helping. Uh, there was two twin girls that are in the, um, that are in the documentary and, you know, they, they kind of got split up at, during the shooting and the one had been severely injured and Dean, who, you know, as a firefighter, he, he already knows what to do and he just sprung into action and, and he really saved this, he really saved the girl's life. And, um, and there's a multi, a multitude of, um, off duty cops. Uh, Tommy, he was also a cop that he had saved, um, uh, another care, uh, not character, but another victim into this, uh, Jonathan, who his story was, I really want to talk about Jonathan because Jonathan was the one he was shot in the neck and, he was he was the one helping the people over the fence. Yes, he yeah. had yeah, he yeah, was yeah, helping yeah. people over the fence. He had he had gotten to safety and he had he was like I need to go back. He said something was pulling me to go back and save people and he went back in. And his story was so incredibly powerful. But I think we need to rewind for a second because the fact that he went back is so telling of the type of person that he was, not just for that sole fact, but he talked about while he was there and feeling like he was an outcast because he was an African-American male at a country concert. And OK, I get it. Like you can roll your eyes. Um, Maybe racism isn't real unless you say it's real. But he was standing there and someone looked at him and was like, oh, what are you doing here? You don't say that. No. <laughs> like. Why? You don't say that to anybody if they look out of place anywhere. Why? Why would you say that? Like, what does it even matter? Yeah, it doesn't like they're there because they like the music. Like it it just that blew my mind. And then you could almost see it on his face. Just him telling it like he looked defeated. 
He was so excited to be there that night. And then you could tell, like, that comment from that one person really, like, brought him down, I felt like, and made him feel so small. It, it did. And it was, it, it, I thought that was a little, it, it, that is incredibly sad that somebody would do that to anybody. And the, like, it was, what it was even, like, kind of strange was that you, like, the footage that they had, like, it instantly, like, it was like yeah. a wave just, like, hit him and he was out of it. You can see the reaction on his face. So him dealing with that and then obviously it's insanity this entire time and he decides to go back and as he's back in there helping people, hoisting them over this fence, he gets shot in the neck and he's stumbling around trying to get someone to help him he's holding his neck clearly bleeding and he walks up to a car and their windows are down and he screams like i've been shot in the neck i really need help like can you take me to a hospital and all they did was roll up their windows and to me like i just that just doesn't it doesn't make any sense to me there's just no excuse for that i don't it doesn't matter it, i just it blew my mind and it broke my heart all at the same time yeah, it, it was really heartbreaking to hear his... It, Jonathan played in a, a huge role in this entire documentary, and he was really inspiring, but y y there was a roller coaster of emotions with him throughout the whole thing because you're like, wow, like, yes, like, he, he was... He had mentioned that, like, country music was his escape. It was, like, his mistress. And you're like, wow, I really like this guy. And then this whole thing kind of happens with the comment that was made about his race and then you were you felt heartbroken for him because he had no bad intentions being there no like he was only there just to enjoy the music he didn't say he was there to get drunk he didn't say he was there to like act crazy he just wanted to listen to music that was it that's the only reason he was there right and and then you hear his story about how you know he he made it out and then he decides to go back in which is incredibly brave i i don't you never know like what you would do yeah. in that situation, but you would hope that you would do something like that. But this documentary really makes you think about that. It it really does. It really makes you think like, what would you do? Mm -hmm. Like, and there's a lot of like, I get this, this documentary really shows you that like, yes, they're, they're in a world that we live in now that is so full of evil and just so many bad things. And, and there's a really hard time to find positives really in anything that this documentary yes there it's rooted in evil but it showed you that there is still good out there there is good in people and people want to do good things and i will say like i the why no one knows but if the attempt was to break people apart i would say the complete opposite happened like the way these people came together afterwards and became a family like literally knew each other's names started getting together and talking with each other that was so like they took something so awful and turned it into something somewhat good and i just thought that that was really amazing yeah it was really amazing they that, they kind of ended the documentary with that about you know they come together and they have groups uh groups um group meetups and they you like know, each other's therapists, I think they said. Right, yeah, they're like each other's therapists, and they don't want to, you know, forget those victims that had lost their lives, and certainly we don't want that either, and we're not going to dive. I, I'm not going to get into the conspiracy theories or anything like that. That's just not what we're going to do here, and I don't want to do that on the pod at all, but it, you know, it just, <laughs> it, it's so just incredible how these people were able to take all of these negatives and put a real positive spin on it and the courage the bravery of all of these victims to continuously do that is great and tom jonathan's story with tommy there's just a, a, another example of you know two people that are you know they're from literally the same town had no idea and they form this incredible bond with each other. Tommy was a uh, off-duty cop that, you know, he came in and, you know, saying, like, I just, my police instincts just 
instantly kicked in and I went right into police mode helping people and it sounded like there wasn't a lot of mention of his wife I I felt like they got this they got um separated well I think too with the whole I found it fascinating the way every cop or first responder in the crowd or working the event the way they talked about it they all said like their training is it's better to do something than to just do nothing so that's what they did they just immediately started doing and starting helping and like the fact that that was their first instinct was so mind-boggling to me i guess because i'm the type of person it's like uh fight or flight or freeze sometimes like i just can't imagine having the instinct to just be like okay now it's my time to help and that's just what i'm gonna do and whatever happens happens after that yeah i i don't know if i could do the same thing that they did in an instant it's just so incredible that you know like there's a lot of bad things that we've obviously have talked about earlier you know like bad there's always one bad cop but you know like these people like it was so refreshing to hear good wholesome stuff about police for once Mm -hmm. and uh and the way that tommy and jonathan you know together like tommy saw jonathan as he went back in to help people over the fence uh you know tommy saw him and saw that he was shot in the neck and then you know this is whenever jonathan was starting to realize oh i'm like really hurt and i need to get to safety and Tommy was like stepped up and, you know, got him to safety, sat with him. Tommy ended up going back in and looking for a vehicle to get him out of there and, um, you know, ended up getting him on a truck. And then the truck ended up making it to the hospital. And it was uh, their story together. I really I really like their story together. And it was just something that, again, really powerful, really inspiring. And. You know, Tommy talked later on that he he figured that Jonathan didn't make it. He was just like, you know, figuring he didn't make it. And whenever he opened his phone to a, some, a link that somebody had sent him that, you know, this guy, you know, he went back in and saved people and he survived. And then they became like best friends, really. And that was another really there's there's so much inspiration in this entire documentary and i feel like there's so much that when we hear about these tragedies you there's so much that you don't think about just because you don't know just that alone the helping all these people and then once you send them to the hospital or drop them off at the hospital or someone takes over you don't know what happens to them and i don't know how they dealt with that because the way i am that would have killed me. That mm-hmm. would have bothered me so much. I would have needed to know that all the people that I tried to help that day were okay. And I need to know, like, as soon as possible. I don't know that I could get to the hospital with the person that I was helping that entire time and let them go. Yeah. And, and that's another thing that Dean had said. Like, I didn't know if the the girl was going to make it or not. And then he ended up getting a phone call from the father, you know, saying that, like, she survived. She's doing well. And then... Dean had ended up going to he he had told her before he got her to safety that you know I'm gonna see you graduate and he ended up surprising her at her graduation and they got like matching tattoos and everything like it was a really the way that they all bonded afterwards and you know really came together it's again inspire that's only this the that, that's I guess that's only one word how to describe this documentary was inspiring there's nothing else that they could have done to shape it in a positive way other than what they did. Mm -hmm. Like that was really the only choice they had other than to crumble. And I think it's, I think that's the story that everyone needed. Yeah. And, you know, there's, you know, we've really covered a lot of the documentary and the inspiring things about the documentary but you know there's there there is an uh, the evil side and you know i I don't know i don't know what there is to do that could have been done to prevent it i think there's a multitude of things and you know i i personally am i am a gun owner and i 
would say I believe in the Second Amendment, but and I hate guns. <laughs> yeah, and just and, kidding. <laughs> Allison is not pro Second Amendment. No, I no, that's not. I'm totally cool with the Second Amendment. I believe that everyone has a right to protect themselves and their homes. That does not mean that they need an automatic assault weapon. Correct. I, you know, I am a gun owner and I own hunting rifles and they were passed down to me from generations and their family heirlooms, I guess you would call them. But and I don't think that those should ever be taken from you. I don't think that anyone should ever have those things taken. And I, I don't, I am a very firm believer of, you know, no one needs to own an AR-15. I personally think that it, it, there's no, there's no good reason. But I think that's the issue when you talk about gun control and you talk about the Second Amendment is people that are for it or people think that the people that are against it so much to say it's not black and white it's not guns or no guns it's just there's a gray area there's a a middle ground that i think could save a lot of lives and i know in the documentary they said that there was nothing that law enforcement could have done to prevent this and like that is very true i think that what they're saying there is the people that were there at the event as it was going on there was nothing that they could have done to stop it at that time and i don't think that there is anything anyone could have done because he was how far away and above everything i i don't think that that's true but or i don't think that that's not true but to say that there were people that sat there and said you know it doesn't matter a gun a bomb a car a knife People that want to kill will kill. I don't think that that's accurate. I think that that is just so insulting to every victim and every victim's family. Because in that situation, in this scenario, it could have been different if it wasn't an automatic rifle. Not that many people would have lost their life. It's just not mathematically possible. You don't have that much ammunition going off at one time. You don't hit that many people. That's it. It's it's impossible to do that and as a gun handler gun owner very you know you know you're i was taught from a my earliest days that i can possibly remember that having a gun is a privilege not a right and you you that is a weapon it was made to kill and it is very it's a very serious you have to take it very serious as a gun owner. And it's, you know, my parents, they, you know, they kept everything locked tight. You know, you know, you don't do anything like this unless you're under adult supervision and, and all of that. And, and I totally get the people that are out there that are going to say, well, you know, it's my right to have this, this gun, this and that, but I don't think that it's right to have any type of AR-15, anything that can be converted into an automatic weapon, it's it should you should not own it. It's not meant for you. It's meant for to protect us. It's not meant to for you to play with. And everyone that says, okay, well, people that want to do it will just they'll get it anyways. He obtained all of the guns legally, all of them. He legally possessed those guns because he bought rifles. And you don't have to report multiple purchases of rifles. He bought 30 rifles within 12 months before the shooting occurred. And I understand the other side of the debate where people say, you know, it's not about gun control. It's about people. Guns don't kill people. People kill people. And so we need to focus on mental health. And like, yeah, obviously, like, I think we need to do both. I think that... You can't do one without also doing the other. Mm -hmm. And but you can't just say that and then walk away. No, because so many people that sit and say, oh, it's my right to have a gun. People need to, you know, talk about mental health are the same people that turn around and place the stigma on mental illness. I think that that's one of the places that everyone needs to start with because everyone can change that. Mm -hmm. Everyone can change the stigma around mental health. And if there wasn't such a shame 
with the fact of having a mental illness, I don't think that things would go untreated and people would go without the help that they need. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and there, there needs to be more checks to balances with obtaining a weapon. And there's, there's not enough. Like I could, we, us two could today could go purchase a weapon exactly like what he did. Like, but okay. I could go purchase a weapon. But I could not be in the military. Yeah. Because of my diagnosis that I have on my health record, which is so wrong. That is so backwards. Yeah. I can't be in the military and defend my country, and rightfully so. I don't blame them for that. But why can I own a gun? Yeah. If I'm not of sound mind to protect the country, I'm not of sound mind to protect my own home. Yeah. Like, I don't think so. I, and that and that's against myself. That's me saying that about myself. I think that there needs to be mental health screenings when you go to purchase a weapon. I just I feel like that is so important. You can't say that mental health and mental illnesses are the reasons that shootings happen without wanting that to be placed in a gun control law. Yeah, and, and there. Yes, I I absolutely believe believe and agree that there needs to be more screenings and then everyone's like well you know they're just they just want to regulate everything the government wants to be involved in everything but the government is there like in, in this instance Isn't i feel that like the point they, they should <laughs> uh, yeah, there's a lot of people that would say like well we need less government in in our lives but you know in something like this people clearly can't police themselves and you know, we should absolutely have somebody step in there and screen these people. I, like, and, and it shouldn't be, I feel like it shouldn't be a one-time deal. Like, you shouldn't just get yeah. screened once when you're 14 or however, you know, like, not, that's, that's 14 but, age is silly. But, you know. I'm, everyone's saying the, the whole people kill people, guns don't kill people thing. If we don't allow them to obtain them legally, they'll just get them somewhere else. So. Uh, what really needs to happen is a firearm education. And, you know, when we talked about Woodstock 99, we said, how stupid is it that they had all these angry people in the crowds and then they gave them candles and they just added fuel to the fire? Mm -hmm. You can't sit back and say, well, if angry people get a hold of guns, they'll kill people, but hopefully they just don't get a hold of them. That doesn't even make any sense. No. That's like throwing a bunch of weapons in a field and just saying, hopefully no bad guys run to them. Yeah. That doesn't, you can't just hope for the best. You can't do that. That's the whole point in the government and the law. You're supposed to prevent people from doing these things. You're not supposed to just say, well, let's hope they don't, but some people need these guns because, no, yeah, I don't think so. So kind of getting back to the documentary itself I, I really really don't want to take away from this documentary documentary or the victims and their families but uh, one thing that we are going to do is in, in the show notes any if you're viewing this on any type of uh, platform that you're listening on we're, we're going to link the documentary in the show notes and uh, we're also going to uh, list all the victims names to honor them and uh, we'll also have a link to an article regarding the healing garden and the memorial um, remembrance wall that they now have for all the victims there. Yes, that is our artwork. So if you're viewing this on Spotify or a platform that lets, that has the custom artwork on there, this is this will be a part of that. So you will see the artwork on there. That'll be the uh, the healing and the healing garden and the remembrance wall. And we just I really I feel like this might be the most important documentary of the year. And it's I deeply deeply encourage everyone to watch this documentary it's it's an incredibly important story that needs to be told and not forgotten it is an incredibly important topic that you know needs to stay on the forefront because this seems like something that continue continuously happens the the way that they 
they ended the documentary. It said that we've had 117 mass shootings since this one. And that's just so sad. And I just, I know that it's hard to watch. And I know that it's something that's hard to talk about. But not talking about it and not acknowledging it is the worst thing that I think we could do. Mm -hmm. Because we have to be talking about these things. We have to make more people aware of what is going on and how awful it really is because without that there will be no change yes and and you know like on the pod ski we like to do a lot of silliness and you know have fun have fun and and this is a really serious topic that i really wanted to do for the show and i wanted to do for the victims as well because this this is something that you know i it's in, so incredibly important that we continue to talk about it we continue to get better as humans and you know we don't forget those that you know didn't get to go home that night and um i just feel that it, it's so incredibly important and if you're gonna watch this documentary i you know I, again i encourage all of you to watch it and it's it it's a it's it's really really good it's a highly recommended watch and but yeah do you have anything else you'd like to add to the pod ski? Um, I'd just like to say that after you watch it, if you have any uh, comments or anything that you also want to talk about or talk to us about, you can. Um, we'll link the Twitter and uh, Instagram and Facebook. And if there's anything you want to reach out and say, go ahead and do that. Um, but I think I just want to thank everybody for listening. Yeah, thank you. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Uh, check us out on uh on twitter and instagram it's the same handle the underscore podski and we're also on twitter at the the podski with john baker uh we thank you so much for listening every week uh allison is a recurring guest she is our fantastic documentary specialist <laughs> and you know anytime we have a documentary that we watch we're that we feel is important and that we really want to talk about we're going to do it and i feel like this is like one of the most important documentaries that we've ever watched and um you know, we hit another milestone this week. If you listened yesterday to yesterday's pod uh, with the whole backstage uh, altercation that happened at Dynamite, you know, I mentioned we hit over 500 downloads and, you know, I didn't know where this kind of was going to go. And, you know, I just really appreciate everyone listening and checking out the pod ski. Please, you know, continuously rate, review, subscribe to any platform that you're on. We're on everything now. So just want to thank all the listeners for watching and please interact with us on social media. We'd love to hear from you and we will see you next week on the pod ski.